Today is April 23rd, 2013, and we are interviewing Wayne Tucker at Monarch, Illinois. Mr. Tucker is 87 years old, having been born on February 2nd, 1926. My name is Cheryl Walker, and I'll be the interviewer. Mr. Tucker, could you state for the recording what war and branch of service you served in? World War II in the uh, Ar Army. And what was your rank when you were discharged? BFC. Okay. Were you drafted or did you enlist? I was drafted. Okay. I got I got the letter from the government and they said my friends and neighbors had selected me. Did you ever find out which friends and neighbors? <laughs> no, I'd sure like to know who they were. <laughs> and how old were you? 18. Okay. So, did you immediately go in after you received your letter or did you wait? No. Uh, we got the letter was about, about six weeks ahead of time before that. And then, uh, then we, uh, as soon as we got the letter, then we had to go to Fort Sheridan and uh, go through uh, where they decide where they're going to send, what you're going to get into. You know, they just send the letter to you, and then uh, they um, we go to we went to Chicago, and then they put us in alphabetical order. And I would have liked to have had the Navy, but they took the Navy first that day. And my buddy that was with me from Rutland, that went with me, uh, his his name was Arndt, so you know where he went. He went in the Navy, and I would see how far down in the alphabet I was. I ended up in the Army, but some of the other guys farther down uh, on the alphabet, they got uh, Marines or uh, oh, what do they call it, Merchant Marines. It's whatever they needed that day, you know. And so then they sent us back home. And then, well, it wasn't only just probably a couple of weeks. And then, then we got them notice that we had to report back to Sher Fort Sheridan. And then we were inducted into the Army. And after you were inducted, where did you go to? Fort McClellan, Alabama. I went down there for basic training. And... Uh, it uh, it's right next to uh, Anniston, Alabama. It's right it's right close to um, Birmingham too. But uh, then I was down there from from May to September, and then in September uh, they they. They decided to send me to to uh, Camp Bowie, Texas. That's uh, and then I took uh, another basic training, a short basic training down there, into the, to an armored division. And then in January, uh, I think it was the second or third of January. Uh, they they prepared us to go to over to uh, Germany, and uh, then we went we went across on the uh, Marine Raven. It's a Liberty ship, and it took us two weeks to go across the Atlantic Ocean. And when when we got we got to France, um, we had. Uh, we went. We went ashore at the uh, at La Havre, France, and then uh, we talked to some of the French people that we could talk to, and they said. And then we had a snowstorm when we got there, and it was a worst. It was the worst snowstorm that they'd had in years there at in, in uh, La Havre. And they <clears throat> they took us to uh, a little town called Totes was the name of it. It wasn't wasn't much of a town, and uh, so we stayed in uh, in a far in a farmer's barn. We stayed up in the hayloft. That's where we slept. 
and uh, that's not we stayed there until I, I'm not just sure how long we was up there, you know, for sure. But we we were there quite a while until our our rest of our equipment got over, and then uh, when our equipment got there, then we uh, we started moving towards uh, towards the front line. Did the <clears throat> farmer feed you? Huh? Did the farmer feed you? Or no, we. <clears throat> they had their cows, their cows and their horses were down below us, so it was pretty nice. You know, we got a lot of heat off of the, off of those, off of those animals. Yeah, it, it was cool, you know, and uh, but we we survived. <laughs> you know, it was it wasn't the best, it wasn't the best in the world, but. Uh, Anyway, did you have your own supplies, your own food, or they how did a, you? They had a uh, small kitchen set up. Uh, if, I think they had several of them set up, and I know uh, our company, and then there was another company that uh, they uh, they ate there at the same one, and uh, we never. The two companies couldn't go at the same time. We had to go in between times, you know. One time, one, one time we'd get to go early. They, they'd always notify us. They always, you know, they told us the day before when you was going to be down there for, uh, for lunch, you know. Most generally, we was, um, we had a lot of times of just uh, sea rations. You know, and then they came. Then they came out with a. Um, it was a box. They called it a five and one. Five fellas ate out of this box for a day. They called it the five and one. So we had uh, uh, bacon in there. In it was the stuff was all in cans, you know, except the dried uh, the dried stuff, you know, that they had. Uh, but anyway, and then, to, but when we left there, <clears throat> when we left uh, in France, uh, it was strictly uh, C rations, K rations, and the five. We still had some five and ones, but not very many. What is the difference between K rations and C rations? Well, uh, C ration is a can. It's a it had uh, well. They had they had ha uh, beans and franks and there's some of them had uh, macaroni and cheese in it, uh, but they were all sealed cans. They gave you a little can opener to open a little the little can. You know that's all you needed. You know, and the K rations were dry. They were um, well, what do you want to call it? Like a like a cracker, you know. But it was a, but that was. But uh, I like the five and one. The only thing is, we had <clears throat> we had to have a fire for the, but they put um, they put um, one of those little can. What they call them canned heat. Those little cans was in there, you know, and you did, you open up the can and. Light a match to it, and it was it was like an alcohol burner, you know. And then, uh, well, now we done, we built a lot of fires, uh, but when we had our tanks to make our coffee in the morning, they they'd start up the tanks, and those the exhaust on the tanks came up up out the, right out of the top of the back end, and we our uh, Motor, our guy at the at the motor pool, he made a he made a little frame that we could set our uh, set our cup on. Boy, it didn't take long. You had hot water, and then uh, and then he uh, our um, half tracks. They all had um, well, they call them flathead engines. 
and he made frames to set on there. And so we put we in the morning we'd set our C rations on top of there, poke a hole in them, and set them on top of there. And by come time to dinner, they were just as nice and warm, <laughs> not what you'd ever want. You know, he was he was an engineering, but unfortunate we lost him. He got killed. His his half track got blowed up. So, but he was a driver, you know, driver for a half track. And then, uh, uh, when we were we were at another place in in uh, in uh, France there, and uh, so a buddy of mine, we decided we'd go to town, go up to a little town, and uh, so we went up there, and as we're on our way up there, we we uh, we seen this. Uh, we were in a jeep. And he had a, uh, <clears throat> we've seen this weapon, they call it a weapons carrier. It's a Dodge weapons carrier. We've seen it sitting alongside the road. And uh, so we thought, geez, if we go back and that thing's still sitting there, maybe we ought to see if it'll run. Well, we kept, we kept trying, we couldn't get it to run. So we just, so we put a chain on it and we pulled it back to our, our, uh, supply our motor pool and the guy down a guy there he says you know you can't you you can't have this thing and we said oh, well let's see if we can get it started so we put some gas in put some gas in we got it started and uh, so we um, we thought it had numbers on it you know, some other division you know so we told him Let's just take all them numbers off of there and put some numbers on the matches for us. And he says, you know, you're going to be in trouble. And we said, well, we don't care. So he, so we, uh, we got that all done, got the numbers all put on it. And uh, I drove that a lot of miles and some of the other guys, everybody drove the thing. So when we were leaving Austria to come home, to come back to France, uh, they were loading all of our um, equipment on, on a train because they weren't going to, they were going to take it back to France on a train. And uh, so when we got, <clears throat> when we was going to load it up, my, our captain, Captain Gar came down and he says, I want to tell you something, Tucker you got to get rid of that thing. So, boy, we went to work. We scrubbed all the numbers off of it and everything. And he says, if we turn that in, you don't get court-martialed. I do. But he says, that the, the numbers that's on that, that thing on the engine and the model number belong to somebody else. So you better get rid of it. So you know what we did? We... <laughs> We took the thing, drove it down the road, and drove it into a shed and left it set. <laughs> so somebody over there ended up with a vehicle that ran beautiful. But they couldn't take it back. They couldn't put it back to us because we were, you know, our numbers weren't on it anymore. <laughs> but we kept it all the time we was over there. Somebody drove it. You know, I mean, you never know who's going to have it, you know. <laughs> so if I needed a vehicle to go someplace, they'd get in it and go. <laughs> of course, uh, we could have all been court-martialed. And one other, I, one other time, we uh, we are in this town. And uh, so John and I, the fellow down in, in Texas, we were... Uh, labeled for um, outpost guard. So they told us we had to go down to this corner, this little town. So we went down there. And uh, so boy, it, oh, it was dark, darker than a stack of black cats. Anyway, we, we were sitting there and pretty soon we heard, uh, we knew it was German soldiers coming down the road, but the road came down 
and then it turned right there where we was at. It, it came down, and the German soldier, we, and they were talking, and we couldn't understand him, so he knew it was Germans. So they came down, and, I, and John says to me, all we have is our rifles. We don't say nothing. We don't stop them because there's too many of them. He says, I said to him, I said, what are we going to do? We'll let them go by. He says, they've got to come down and turn and go that way. He says, so I said, okay. But I said, if we get if we get picked up for letting them go by, he said, we're going to get court-martialed. He said, let's take a chance. It's either court-martialed or they'll shoot us. So so we had a army blanket with us, so we just pulled that army blanket up over the top of us. Of course, it was dark. They couldn't have seen us anyway. We had already dug in a, a, a hole big enough to sit down in, you know. <laughs> so the Germans, they came by and they went down the other road. And then so about a half hour later here, they come back and they went back the same way they <laughs> went. And John says, well, we're safe. <laughs> I said, yeah. I said, I don't know where they went. And I said, well, I don't care where they went. <laughs> but anyway... <coughs> But then we went to, and then in that trip, we we started out for, uh, oh, to go to uh, Berlin. Uh, they said that, that, that we could, that we could go up to uh, Berlin. They told us that we was going to head up that way. And so we got up as far as uh, Hamburg. Hamburg, Germany, and they, I got a map here, <laughs> anyway, and they told us to, that, no, we're not going to let you go all the way up to Berlin, uh, we're going to let the Russians take Berlin, and so they turned us around, they sent us back, and then we ended up going down to uh, Austria, and, um, we uh, we got down there to um, Rigsburg. We got down there on April the thirtieth in forty five, and uh, then that's um, and then from there to to the Inn River. I don't really. It seemed like it was forever to get there, but then that's where uh, when we was going, we was going, we, we should have crossed the Inn River that day. But our captains and all the guys said, no, we'll wait till tomorrow, till we can, everybody can get across in daylight. Well, <laughs> that night, the Germans, they decided nobody's going to come across that bridge, so they blowed it up. So then our, uh, our captain, he, uh, he said, well, why don't you guys? Some of you guys go across on the bridge. You can crawl. You can, you can walk on the on the on the railings of the bridge, but you can't walk on the platform because it's gone. So, him and uh, some of the other guys they went across. Uh, I don't know where I was, but I I didn't go across. And uh, they went across. And they got over there, and it was an ambush. I mean, they the Germans were sitting there waiting for them. And uh, so the captain was with him, and uh, so finally he he said he told the guys he says we can't go back on the bridge because they got they got too many machine guns. So he he says there's only one thing for us to do. He says you'll have to swim. And uh, so they uh, jumped into the river, and. Uh, and walked across. I mean, of course, it wasn't it wasn't real shallow, you know. But they they made it back. But uh, I felt so sorry for him because he, you know, he thought he was doing a good deed. Well, everybody thought he was, you know. But anyway, and that, uh, and then we didn't need more than get across the, the river. 
until uh, the message came down that uh, the Germans had uh, had signed a treaty, had decided to sign a treaty, and they weren't that they were done. So then uh, they they said, "Well, we can't let you go back to France right now. Uh, we're going to we're going to billet you here." So they billeted us all right in anything we could stay in. You know, there's all kinds of shacks and stuff down there and in Austria and uh, so then we uh, and then they uh, they told us well you got to go into occupation and uh, so we had to we had to go and check all the all the houses and everything in this this little burg that down there I can't remember the name of it right now <coughs> It's right close to um, it's right close to where um, Hitler's birthplace. Uh, he was born in Austria. Anyway, um, we uh, we stayed there. I think until May. May the sixth, May the twenty sixth, May the twenty sixth. We we left there in forty five. <clears throat> we left there and uh, they uh, they put us on uh, uh, on the train. They had uh, box cars, and so we had uh, so they gave us lumber, and so we built. Uh, platforms so that you could put a double deck that put some guys stuff down on the bottom on the floor and then some up on the second you know they built another and so that's we went back from there to uh, France in um, in those box cars they didn't have any uh, passenger cars or anything and uh, but they but we were real lucky they when it come to meal time, they the uh, military they had these um, they call them kitchens. It was in those trucks, and uh, they they would supply us with a, with a meal. Uh, it wasn't real fancy, but hey, it was food, you know. And uh, but then then that. It took, I don't know, it seemed like it took, it took us about three days to go back to, uh, back to France. And then they, uh, they put us into a camp. Uh, they named all those different camps along in France there with cigarettes. And we were in Chesterfield was the name of the camp that we were in. But they had camel, lucky strikes, and, you know, different camps. And uh, while we were there, there was a there was a nice stream that came down through a uh, nice creek, like you know, not very big. So we decided that we would dam it up. So we got a hold of some poles, and so we made a dam to make us a swimming pool. Because that was that was really uh, our our best bath that we. <laughs> We had while we lived over there. The rest of the time, you you took your bath in your steel helmet, and you know I mean that's all you had. But hey, uh, it was it was one of those deals. But then, as soon as the General William Black came, the ship, we got on there, and it took us uh, six and a half days to come to to uh, the States. And then, so then when we got here, I, I went home, I came home to, I was in Rutland. I came home to Rutland and then um, uh, while I was there, you know what, uh, Harry Truman dropped the, the two atomic, atomic bombs on Japan. And then we, uh, uh, I went, but then uh, I still had to go to California. 
I mean, they uh, went out to Camp Cook, California. And then we got out there, and they had two. Um, it was the 13th Armored was in that Camp Cook. And uh, the 12th uh, Armored Division. And so there wasn't no there wasn't enough beds for everybody, so they they get they they issued us mattresses, so we slept on the floor. So we was out there oh, a couple of weeks or so I don't remember just how long, but it was you know not too long. And so they told us they said, if you can get some money to go home, we'll give you forty five days forty five day furlough, and you can go home. And boy, I tell you. I called mom and I said, "Mom, send me some money. I'm coming back home for 45 days." So I did. I come. I came back home, and, and uh, so I'm in the 40. And then while I was here, uh, I helped my dad. He was working at an elevator there, and so I helped him. And uh, so when the 45 days up, I went back to California. Got out there. I was only out there a couple of weeks, and they said, "Well, I wanted to have a parade in San Antonio, Texas." And I thought, oh, geez, no. I hope they don't pick me. Boy, I tell you, I stayed back. And so I finally, they come down and they said, well, it's you, <laughs> you know, how they do, you know, you, you, and you. And so uh, I ended up in uh, camp in um, Fort Hood, Texas. And then we were down there. We were down there about a month. And then we had, they told us we had to get, uh, they had equipment down there, you know, tanks and, and tracks and trucks that, that they wanted us to get ready to, so we could go on that parade. And those things had sat down there so many, so long, that the condensation, it got so bad in the gas tanks. And boy, the water, we had, we had more trouble driving from Fort Hood to, uh, Oh, what was the name of that? Fort Sam Houston is the other uh, camp that's right next to to uh, Fort Worth. And uh, so we, uh, not Fort Worth, San Antonio. Anyway, uh, that's where they're going to have the parade. <coughs> so anyway, uh, they, uh, we had more trouble trying to get those trucks and tracks and tanks down there because the condensation in the tanks was so bad. But we got through the parade all right. Then I come back to <clears throat> came, came back to uh, Camp Bowie, not Camp Bowie. Uh, what's that? Fort Hood. Fort Hood. Came back to Fort Hood and I thought geez, why can't I get out of here? And I, so I kept telling them, I said, gee whiz, <clears throat> I'd sure like to be home for Easter, you know, because Easter was early that year, you know, in, uh, in uh, April. April? Yeah, I'm pretty sure it was, yeah, it was April. Anyway, um, I finally, <clears throat> I talked to the guy in our um uh, our warrant officer, I talked to him and I was asking him, I said, Boy, I sure like to be home for Easter this year. I says, What am I gonna do? I got nothing. I can't I can't stay here. I said, What am I gonna do here? And he says, That's all right. He says, If you if you can figure out a way to get to he says, We're not gonna discharge you here because we'll have to pay your expenses to go <laughs> to go to to uh, Fort Sheridan or go to home. He said, uh, you'll go on a trip train to Fort Sheridan. So I did. And I got there on Friday. And they said, hey, no way you're going to get through here. I said, come on. I said, look how many we got here that wants to go home for Easter. And so they said, well, we'll work nights and evenings. We'll get you through, you know, to get you out of the service. And... So by golly, Saturday evening, about well, it was it was early in the, about early in the evening, you know, 
wasn't dark. Anyway, they said, "All you, all you got, all you guys got to do is, is have transportation." And I says, "I got transportation," because I knew that uh, it was. Uh, I forget. There was a trail. It was a. I think it was trail away bus line that came to uh, uh, down to Peoria from up there. And I so I said to the guy, I says, I got transportation. And he says, go. So the guy signed my my uh, discharge, and I was gone. <laughs> and I got and I got uh, I got home. It was late that night, but I got to go to church the next morning, Easter Sunday, and then that was it. But then, after I got home, you couldn't buy a job. I mean, I, I bet you, I'd like to know how many applications I put in. I went, to, they had a brickyard in the streeter, a tile yard in the streeter, two glass plants, Caterpillar, where wherever I could go, I I put an application in. But there was hey, there was thousands of guys that were getting out, and so you know they couldn't they couldn't get a job. There was nothing to have, so I finally landed a job <coughs> at a um, <coughs> oh I'm. Um, Oh, milk factory up here in Tonica, Illinois. <clears throat> didn't pay, <laughs> didn't pay a lot, but it was spending money, and uh, so <clears throat> I worked there until from the time I got out of service until October, and then I went back to Caterpillar to get it, try to get another job down there. So I finally got a job down there, but uh, they put me on a forklift. You know, I, I I rode that thing and I hated that thing. <laughs> so, uh, then finally there was a fella here in town that I knew I knew real well before I went to service because my my brother had worked for him before he went. <clears throat> and uh, anyway, uh, I went I came down here and because he had run an ad in the paper wanting to to uh, have somebody to, uh, to work with him. And so I came down and applied for the job, and I got the job. I worked for him for 20 years, and then uh, he was going to sell out. So there was another shop here in town, so I went down there, and I asked him if I could get a job, and he said, oh, yeah. So I worked there 10 years, and then... Uh, and then he was he was getting kind of shaky on the job, you know, because things were things weren't the best. And so then they they was going to start an insulation factory out here and uh, making a blowed in insulation. So uh, my boy, him and his wife, they had he had moved back here uh, for just so he could go to school. So. Uh, I went out there and got a job out there. I'd done, I'd done all their electrical work, hooked up all their machines and everything, to, you know, to make insulation. And, and then I worked there for, what I worked there, about two and a half years, Mom. Okay. And then uh, the guy came down one morning when he was having coffee break, and he told us, he says, you know, I'm just paying, he's, me and another guy, uh, he, uh, the, I'm just paying you too much. He says we're going to have to cut cut someplace. He said I think I'm going to have to lay you two fellows off. And uh, so I talked to the other guy. I said, "Well, I says this is Monday. I said I'm going to stay here all week anyway." I said, uh, "How about you?" And he said, "Yeah." And so we didn't do anything all that week. Uh, every night. When I'd come home, I'd, I'd, I'd bring so many tools home, you know, because I had moved a lot of my stuff out there. And because uh, I thought it was going to be a, a, a job for a long time. And uh, so then I, uh, 
Um, I stayed all that week. <coughs> yeah, I didn't work. I didn't work for them at all. I just was there. This other guy, a buddy of mine, he was there too. He he came with them from when they came here to start the factory. He came from Kansas. So anyway. Uh, it was on third on Wednesday. Wednesday, wasn't it, Mom? On Wednesday, I I left there to come home, and she had told me she wanted something from the grocery store. So we had a little grocery store over here. It's gone right now. But anyway, uh, I I had she wanted me to get something there, so I stopped there to get it, and I run on to a fellow out here, a farmer out here, Leslie Barth, and uh, so. I, he said, what are you doing here? How come you're not working? I said, well, yeah, I got laid off. He said, I got you a job. He pointed at me. He said, I got you a job. And I said, I thought to myself, I don't want a job on a farm. And, uh, but I never said anything to him, you know. But he left. He, that's all he said to me. He never said anything else. And so pretty soon I got in the house here and, and the phone rang. And it was the superintendent of schools. And so he called and he says, uh, Leslie Barth called and said that you were looking for a job. And I said, yeah, I am. He said, well, uh, why don't you come down and fill out an application? And, and I said, I can't do it today. And I said, i got to go to work tomorrow. Well, he says, when can you come down and fill out? And I never did fill out an application. I went down to school and went to work, and I worked maintenance for the school. And they had a school here, and in Rutland, and in Dana, and then they had the high school here. So I never knew where I was going to be. I mean, I, wherever school had a trouble, had a problem, I was there. And then in between time, I swept floors. <laughs> swept floors and mopped floors and and had fun with the kids and, and back then you had fun with the kids and I worked there for what 13 years wasn't it? Yeah. I worked there at the school for 13 years and until uh, I was uh, 62 years old and I hung it up like the devil I, <laughs> I came home I came over here and started my shop up here. <laughs> and just in the last couple of years, I have, I've settled down to nothing. nothing. <laughs> That's about it. Well, I have some questions. You said you <clears throat> went over to France on a Liberty ship. Yes. And it took two weeks. Can you explain what a liberty ship is? You know, they they made them up here at at Seneca, Illinois. They had a, a shipyard up here. Dad worked there at uh, at that uh, you know, uh, and they made them. They I tell you, it wasn't much of a ship when when we were when we were going across. We ran into it. An Atlantic storm, and uh, so uh, that thing, that thing would bob and weave both ways, you know, and rock back and forth, <laughs> and the gun thing, the the water would come up on the front of it, and then the thing would go the other way, and the water would come up on the back end of the ship. So they had it all roped off, and the only place you could you couldn't get any ways near the front of the big or the back of the ship and uh, <laughs> yeah, oh it was it was something so did a lot of you get sick on them you know there was a lot of them did but, but you know they came down they came down when we was we were still in uh, in uh, the port here and I think it was by New Jersey we were at a port by New Jersey I think I was, yeah, Camp Kilmer, New Jersey is where we were at. Anyway, they uh, they come down in the, the deck down there, and they said we need we need four volunteers. 
And you know, they always told me when you went into the service, don't never volunteer for nothing, you know. Well, I did. And three other guys did. You know what we did? We worked officers' mess when they were eating beans downstairs. <laughs> We were eating steak upstairs. <laughs> oh, we had it made. And then uh, we would, uh, if we'd go into the storeroom and uh, we'd get we'd get cans of uh, peaches and pears and, and stuff, <laughs> apricots. <laughs> and it's, it's, but we we really had it made. There was there was four of us that they they wanted four, and I. And my buddy uh, that's down in Fort Worth, he said, he told me, he said, boy, he says, how many times was you told don't never volunteer? I said, well, hey, I made it. Was that the only time you volunteered? I think that was it. <laughs> so you didn't want your luck running out? No, what? You didn't want your luck to run out? No. <laughs> And another thing you don't want to do, if they come and they say, we need truck drivers, you never volunteer for that because you know what the truck is? A wheelbarrow. <laughs> <laughs> hey, they had a way of working you. So you were in France. Yep. And then from France, you went into Germany. Yeah, Germany. Okay. And then... South to Austria, okay. and then, um, then we come back to France. Okay, so you traveled by jeeps and tanks. We had everything. Everything that an armored division. We had uh, tanks, uh, half tracks, trucks, jeeps, trucks, and this truck we stole. <laughs> And you were in the 13th Armored Division. Yeah. And what was your job duties? Mine? Mm-hmm. I would say it's probably, I think it was just an inf infantryman. I think that's what they called him. Okay. I think that was our, uh, I think that's what they called us. Uh, you done what it, you done whatever the our uh, your captain or your your squad leader, you know. You done what they said told you to do. Sometimes you, they told you some things you didn't like to do, but you did them anyway. The thing that I didn't, I just oh, I hated it is uh, is to go back for supplies. We used to have to we had to go back and you know you go from the front, go back and get supplies. Uh, I, I hated that job because uh, you had no protection. I mean, uh, but we had we had trucks and half tracks and uh, most generally when we went back to, to get stuff, we went back with half tracks, you know, half tracks and trucks and uh, there would probably be a tank with us too, you know. But the thing of it is, uh, we couldn't we couldn't travel at night because those Germans were waiting for us at night. In fact, one time we was coming back and and uh, it was running into night, and so the the uh, lieutenant that was with us he told us he says. Um, we're not going to travel tonight. We're going to have to take this wooded area here, and we're going to stay there. So we, so we pulled into this wooded area, and I don't know how those Germans knew where we was at, but they did, and they, they started a mortar and uh, artillery barrage on us, and, uh, well, I, th I thought, boy, we're doomed. But me and this other kid, uh, we decided that. We seen this hole 
in the ground, and we thought, boy, we're gonna we're gonna get down in there, and we'll be safe, you know. Well, we got down in there, and we're standing there, and pretty soon he says, you know what? What's wrong? He says, I'm sinking. I said, oh. He said, I think we're going to have to get out of here. And come to find out it was a German garbage dump. <laughs> so, so we we got out of there and, and, went, and decided, well, we're, we're going to have to just face the storm, I guess. <laughs> and then we had some of the truck drivers that, and we had uh, trucks that was loaded with gas, you know, and uh, we had one truck driver that he got underneath the truck. And so, boy, we ran over and told him, said, don't get onto that thing. He said, if they drop one of those artillery on that, on that truck, you're gone. I said, you'll never get out. You'll burn up. And, uh, but we were in a, we were in a wooded area. And, uh, but, most of the most of the artillery and mortar shells they were hitting in the trees. Some of them come through, but not not very many of them. They they didn't they wouldn't come you know they wouldn't get through the trees. Can <clears throat> can I ask you you know one of the reasons why I know because the the Germans you know would ambush you. But was it difficult to drive at night because of blackouts? You oh, yeah. To... Well, see, we had blackout lights on those vehicles, oh. you know, that you could drive. But uh, the trouble of it is, I think, really, I think the reason they did that is because they had so many people that would tip them off that, that we were moving, you know, and... They, uh, if we had been out on the roads, we'd oh, we've been terrible, you know, because they could have spotted us on those roads. When you say you had, you had blackout lights, can you explain what blackout lights are? Oh, they're well, they're not much of a light, I'll tell you. You, you can, and they shine right down, right down in front of you, you know, and all vehicles had them, but they. There wasn't no, you, you couldn't see, you couldn't see, uh, oh, so you couldn't see five feet in front of you. You know, there, there's not much of a light there. But we had them, but uh, our lieutenant that was with us, he told us, he said, uh, the way things look, he said, we better, you know, the way they had been working, you know. But that was the first time that we, that we'd ever ran into a to a barrage. We had a couple other ones, you know, where they had shelled us, but we were lucky. You know. What about you show that you were in the Ruhr, Ruhr Pocket? Ruhr, Ruhr Pocket, yeah, that was, uh, they had, um, see they they had a lot of German divisions that were that had stayed in there, you know, and they thought they were safe until they decided uh, that they was going to get them out of there, you know, because they were staying right in that. It must have it must have been a valley like. I'm not sure what that, but anyway, uh, I forget how many. Uh, Oh, there was, oh, there was thousands of German soldiers in there, and of course we, uh, I forget how many we uh, we took uh, prisoners in that, in that you know out of the Ruhr pocket. And the the trouble of it is, in that I mean you, uh, there was so doggone many, and they were. They were kids. They were, you know, they were really young, young kids. It was hardly big enough to carry a, a rifle, but they, they were there. I mean, they were, oh, gee, was probably 13, 14 years old, you know. I mean, they, they if you, 
they, they put them in the service. And you know they were German because you couldn't understand them, you know. Um, <clears throat> you talked about the bridge that was blown up. Yeah. Do, do you feel that, how do you feel by not having gone over the night before? Do you well, feel that, Captain? I think... I think if we would have went over the day before, because there were so many German, there was a German uh, division over there. I think they would have. Uh, I think if if we would have started to cross the bridge, they were waiting for us. I really do. In fact, I wouldn't be a bit surprised that they waited for us to get some vehicles on the bridge, and then they blow it up. But they had they had uh, they had so dug how many uh, uh, bridges that they had uh, put those. And as soon as you, as soon as you hit the bridge, uh, it was, they had it fixed with a trigger that it blow the thing up, you know. And then we crossed. Uh, it was let's see, we were crossing the Rhine River. And uh, they <clears throat> they came out with the of course they they did a lot of these mines they put them along the banks of the of this by this uh, particular this one particular town the Rhine was a little shallow right there at that point and that's where we was going to go across so they had to mine the guys that checked out for mines um, they had they had staked it. You know, they put those stakes in, so don't you stay between the stakes because there's no mine there. Well, one of our uh, half-track drivers, uh, just as he got to the other side of the of the uh, river, there was a mine there, and his half-track, the front, front wheel, we never did find the front wheel of that half-track. It, oh, it, bl it blowed that off, and... Uh, we always kept the camouflage net fastened to that fender too. It disappeared too. Oh, it was so we so we got another so we had to go back and get another half track because they, we lost that one. But that's that's the hazards, I guess. That's the hazards of war. <clears throat> Were you ever involved in any battle planning? No. You were just told what to do. We just, yeah. <laughs> you do this and you do that. That's about it. That's the way they, yeah, that's what they did. You went where they told you to go. You knew you had to go or else you was in trouble. Do you feel that um, your officers, when they were leading you on your missions, do you feel that they uh, took and and had your best interest as soldiers? I think so. I do. I yeah. They. Uh... They wouldn't tell you to go someplace that they wouldn't go. Mm -hmm. No, they, they wouldn't. No. Okay. Now they, uh, we had, uh, Captain Gar was our, uh, was our captain. And then, of course, we had, uh, let's see, five, four, no, five. We had five other lieutenants, or not lieutenants, uh, uh, yeah, lieutenants, first lieutenants. And in fact, we had some second lieutenants with us, too. But Captain Gar, he was the one that, and then, see, then we joined in the Patton's Army. And uh, so we were with them. 
So we had a lot of divisions that were together. Um, we had uh, the 101st Airborne was with us uh, part of the time. Um, let's see. Gosh, I can't think of, can't remember all of them that was there. We had another armored division, too. Um, 10th, I think. I'm not sure if, which which other one was with us. Uh, you really didn't, you really didn't know who all was there, uh, you know, that was with us. Um, I was trying to find here, I was going to tell you how many uh, prisoners that we got there at the, in the rear pocket, but I guess I don't see it here. But there was, oh, there was thousands of them that, you know, that we got. Did you take anything with you for special, um, for good luck, or um, as, did I keep anything? Did you take anything with you, or did you keep anything? Uh, that's what, I'm going to show you something after bed. Okay. Okay. I'll tell you the story about this thing. Okay. Anyway, we had a a um, supply sergeant that. Um, he, he was a collector, and he was a guy that if you wanted something, and you tell him the day before, and boy, if he could get it, you had it the next day. And uh, so anyway, he came out with, uh, uh, when we were in Austria, he came out with a, uh, a German flag. So uh, he brought it to our company. Of course, he was uh, he was with the, you know with our company. Anyway, uh, he brought it, and I vaguely remembered that he spread it out, and our company we all signed our name to it. And so uh, I, anyway. Uh, uh, I was talking to this my fellow, my buddy down in Texas, and uh, I asked him if he remembered it, and he says vaguely. You know, you, you forget things like that. Anyway, so uh, what's it been, Mom? About three years ago. Three years in January, yeah. Anyway, um, there's a lady that lives down in uh, Bath, Illinois. Um, Judy Hurdle is her name. Anyway, she was a she's a collector. If you could see her house, you could know she is a collector. Because I bet we've been there. Anyway, uh, uh, she was at a flea market in Princeton, and she seen this German flag there. So uh, she bought it. What'd she pay for it, Mom? Uh, $112. Yeah. Anyway, she bought it. And so evidently, this fellow, this supply sergeant, evidently he died and his family disposed of his stuff. And uh, that's the way I figured. That's, that's the only way I can figure that it happened. Well, the reason uh, she bought it was because her father was yeah. in the same. He was, in the, he was in the Army, too. Well, it was the same, but not with the way. Yeah, anyway, uh, she wanted it. She, she seen it, and she wanted it. So so she took it, and she bought that in, in 1995. Right? 
I think it was. Yeah, 1995. Anyway, so then she uh, uh, she just she held on to it because she was a school teacher. So she just held on to it, and then she. Uh, um, I tried to buy it from. No, she would look for the names. It yeah, she, oh there. yeah, that's right. She that's kept trying she to find somebody. So uh, she sent me some pictures of it, and um, I I don't I really don't know how she ever connected with me. I think she connected with me through my boy. I think. My boy lives in Washington State. So anyway, um, they um, um, they went to Kansas City with us for a reunion. And so we were out to Kansas City, and she brought the flag out there and was showing it at our 13th Harvard reunion. And I asked her again out there, I said, Judy, why won't you sell it to me? I said, I said, I'll, I'll give you some extra. I said, I just, I want it. And she says, no, 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 don't sell it. I said, well, okay. So then, uh, uh, it was in February, wasn't it? Or January. January? Yeah. And she, uh, she called me and said she was coming up to see me. And so her and her husband came up. So she came walking up across, up across the yard with a plastic, one of those plastic uh, carrying bags, you know, not not a grocery bag, a, a carrying bag. She had the flag and she gave it to me. So I've got it. If we want to pay for her, she wouldn't take the money for it. No, she, she said, no, no. She says, I'll let you take care of it. So that's what we're going to. I've got it. I want to show that to yeah, you. Yeah, sure. Because you won't believe. You won't believe what it looks like. And that the material, as old as it is, it's still good. Well, I've, we've, I've showed it to, at the school and, and that, you know. It, it's, it's really something to see. There's one kid. He said, that's a Nazi flag. Of all the kids in my grade school over here, up to through the sixth grade, he was the only one that knew that that's what it was. It was really something. And I have him show it, so. Were you able to stay in touch with your family? Through letters? Uh, was it difficult? By mail only. That's all we had. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, I wrote to mom a lot, um, but our letters were so slow. You talk about John. Can you tell me about John? Was he in your unit? In what? Was John in your division? Oh, yeah, he was, he was my buddy. We, when I left, um, when I went to um, Camp Bowie, Texas, John Holt is the, is the, guy's, the kid's name. His picture's up there on the refrigerator. He's the one in that corner. <laughs> That's John. Anyway, uh, him and his wife. Uh, he, uh, yeah, he's. Oh, we, we were buddy. We were buddy buddy all together all the time. We. We went to church together. We, well, we just done everything together. You well, we, know? we went down to see him. Oh, yeah. yeah. Went down Tennessee. for his uh, anniversary. And, you know, went down to Texas. And uh, anyway, uh, when I left uh, to go down to Camp Bowie, when I went in, uh, when I went into the barracks, <clears throat> he was the only guy that was in there. Just so we were sitting down talking, and John says to me, he says, uh, boy, if I could find my way home, I'd leave this place. 
And I says to John, I said, now John, just think. I said, you can go home if you want to, but they're going to be standing there at the gate when you walk up to get you. And he says, you really think so? And I said, yes. I said, if you went AWOL, I said, they would, they'd get you. And, you know, he's told me that so many times. He said, boy, am I glad you told me that. <laughs> yeah. You talked about after the bridge and blew up that then you were going back into France and you were put on operation? We were on, uh, uh, we, before we got to France, we had, um, we were in occupation. Occupation. Yeah. Can you explain what occupation is? Well, we, we just had to kind of, they wanted us to check all these t little towns to see if there's any, uh, any German, uh, like any troops build up, you know. Uh, and that's all. I don't know. You know, we never found any. We never found any troop build up, and uh, nothing. But but we had to go through through the towns, and we had to. The main thing we had to do is pick up if we uh, found any weapons of anything, you know, to, to take them. I suppose they disposed of them, you know, but uh, we, we had to haul them back, you know. You shared with me some statistics that when you were stationed in, um, with your troop, with your division, the 13th Armored Division. And while you were over there, <clears throat> um, the overseas statistical data, and it said that there was 253 killed in action, 912 wounded in action, that you liberated 4,100 4, were American prisoners of war. Yeah, they were in uh, Austria. They were in, um, in a prison camp down there. Um, and you know, <clears throat> I don't have any idea what they done with them. All I know is we seen them and then they were gone. So they must have, they probably shipped them out someplace. I don't know how they would have shipped them because uh, those trains were terrible. They, they, rotten. I found that this was amazing. You used 1,987,550 gallons of gasoline. Yeah, that's right. Well, you stop and think. Those those tanks had uh, two <coughs> two uh, eight cylinder Chrysler engines in them, and the half tracks had they were uh, they were only six cylinder. Uh, they were a Chrysler engine too, in those. And then hey, we had oh geez, the jeeps jeeps and trucks and just think, I mean, it, oh. But yeah. what, what amazes me is, how did you get that gasoline? With these supply runs that I was telling you about. We'd go back and they, those always, can, they came in uh, five gallon cans. You've, you've ever seen a, a canister that they have? Okay. These trucks, these trucks would be loaded and those cans were designed. They were designed that you could stack them, so they stacked them three deep in the truck, as many as you could get in there. I mean, they 
they filled him Turks full. And one bullet would have just oh, ignited. Forget it. <laughs> forget the truck and the everything. <laughs> then one million one hundred and eighty nine thousand six hundred and thirty rounds of thirty caliber shells. Yeah. So, somewhere along the line they were used through machine guns. <laughs> machine guns and rifles, they all they all use the same shell. That was a lot of shells that That's somebody the, made over here. Yeah, somewhere. <laughs> And then 14,382 rounds of 105 caliber shells. Yeah, those were the artillery. That was artillery. Our uh, artillery. Because, you know, if, you'd, if you got in trouble and the Germans got a little bit too rough for you, you'd call back for artillery and then you'd sit there and you'd, as soon as you'd call back and you'd, they'd say, let's see. Where are we going to shoot them to? How far, you know? And then, so you'd sit there and you'd wait. And pretty soon you'd hear them going over and thank the Lord they went over. <laughs> you know, you could hear them going over. And you could hear the Germans when, <laughs> if they'd happen to make a mistake and go too far, you could hear them. They had a different sound than what ours did. It, uh, it was a little more noisy than ours were. It must have been the fin that they had on the back. I'll tell you another thing that happened <clears throat> over there. And I don't know whether it happened with us. I, I really couldn't tell you. But uh, there was a lot of their 88 shells that they fired, that the Germans fired, that didn't explode. And the reason they didn't explode... <clears throat> They had uh, <clears throat> they had slave labor doing the uh, uh, loading of the shells, and uh, the, so they were booby trapping them. And they were putting sand and something else in there so they wouldn't explode. They took the powder out of them. You know, I mean, they didn't take it out. They just didn't put it in. You know. <clears throat> but that was a lot of them went off. <clears throat> we uh, we lost our first sergeant. Uh, he oh the poor guy. I mean he didn't know what he had. He it was too close to him. I mean but anyway we lost him. This is another statistics that amazed me. You, your division, the 13th Armor Division, took 1,556 officers as prisoners. Yeah. <laughs> you took 27,827 enlisted men. That was, that was a rear pocket, was where the big deal was. I, <clears throat> somewhere... Somewhere in some of my stuff that I got, is, yeah, I can tell you exactly where that, but I'm sure it was a rare pocket <laughs> <coughs> where they got them. <clears throat> you guys were busy men. Well, hey, we got, hey, we got a big division, you know, a lot of, oh, gee, lots of guys, you know. Um, uh, I was going to try to. I don't see it here. Yeah, I was going to show you a picture of our division. I got one here, but that's not our division. <clears throat> hey, Mom, uh, look in the other thing. And We're in that case. A, yeah. You said that you, you you had reunions. Do you still have reunions? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, it was at Kansas City and then Chicago, and I was just was talking to John the other day, and he got a, uh, I didn't get my notice, I don't know why I didn't get mine, um, but I think it's, I think it's out in, um, oh, I think he told me New York, 
Why it's out there, I have no idea. See, our um, our secretary lives in up here by Chicago. And she's, uh, you know, she takes care of everything. She does a beautiful job. Her husband was in the service with us, and so she just took over. You know, uh, I'm sure it. I'm quite sure I don't say in here where she. But she lives up by Chicago. I know they pay her. You know, she gets paid because because we pay we pay all the time to to you know to the to the division. You know, for the reunion. And then. I just bring it here. I don't know what you really looking for. I'm looking for a picture of the of our our guys. So is the 13th armor, armor Division still an active division of the Army? Just all we are is a... Um, no, it's not active. No, no, no. It's all... Uh, there's what some of our machines look like. Our, this was during the parade. Yeah, it was the parade down in Texas, yeah. I don't know if this, there was nothing in the other part for the outside. I got so much, I tell you what, I got so much stuff that I've, sa I've saved. And what would you want to take your picture? Too much stuff. If I can. No. I know I got one someplace. Yeah, but it wasn't in there. That's what I got that. Maybe Judy's letter. Judy Hurdle. Here's some of, <clears throat> some of our guys. <clears throat> That's our company. <clears throat> I'll tell you, you two people, I'm going to have to take a trip to the back. <laughs> well, he's a nice looking man, gentleman there. So this is it. Oh, I think that's what he was looking for. Yeah. I'll tell you what. Oh, that's it. There, right there. there you go. That's it. You found it. It's sitting right here. <laughs> Now I know you what you're going to say. You're going to say, where am I at in there? And you're yes. going to tell me I have no idea. I wasn't going to say because I couldn't remember where it was. I'm down in, down in here someplace. Kind of towards the front, I think, wasn't it, Dad? You can tell where your glasses. Yeah, hmm. here's John. Huh. <laughs> I know where he's in back room. You get off. Here I am. Oh, yeah. Right there. That's a big division. Oh yeah, that's a well, you know. 
There's a lot of guys. <clears throat> well, Mr. Tucker, I want to thank you for your time. And thank you for hey, your we're not going to let you go without lunch. We'll take you out the restaurant and have lunch. No? Yeah. Thank you very much.